Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, so welcome to the online causal inference seminar this week. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Professor Tyler T Vanderbilt from Harvard University this week uh, speaking about his uh, most recent work about causal inference and measure construction towards a new model of measurement. After Tyler's talk, uh, we have uh, Professor Frederick Savia from Yale University um, will be giving a discussion. And at the end, uh, Tyler will have a chance to respond. Uh, the Q&A today will be handled by Dominic. And Dominic, do you want to say a few words about uh, Thanks, Jinguan. Yes, as usual, please submit your questions via Q&A. Uh, we don't have a collaborator in chat today. That means we will bring all questions directly to Tyler. Um, yeah, without further ado, um, uh, let's get started. Tyler, uh, whenever you're ready. Excellent. And can I share the screen? Okay, there we go. Okay, is that coming through? Yes. Excellent. Well, it's a pleasure um, being here with you all today, and um, I'll be presenting um, uh, some relatively recent work on the relation between causal inference and, and measure construction. A, a brief disclaimer before I jump into the material, I certainly don't um, consider myself an expert on uh, psychometric measurement theory, um, but uh, the last couple of years have, have shifted my methodologic research to, to this topic, so still trying to learn more uh, about it, but some of my more empirical work on well-being um, motivated trying to learn more about uh, measurement theory, um, and, and that led me to think about how, how does this really intersect with um, causal inference, and so um, I'll be providing, in some sense, a critique of the use and interpretation of, um, of factor analysis, and um, we'll be doing so through two more technical results, um, one with regard to how the factor model is interpreted and the extent to which it's given a causal interpretation, and um, what I think is often a very uh, subtle um, uh, move that is, is made often without any sort of justification that um, given that a factor model fits well, that it, it in fact has a structural interpretation. And I'll um, try to challenge that notion. And then I'll also ask the question, what happens if we have multiple factors and there are causal relations between them? How does that alter what we might end up with or the conclusions we might draw uh, if we run a factor analysis with one wave of data? Um, I'll present the result on an alternative interpretation of um, attempts at drawing causal inferences from measures that we construct from a series of indicators and um, offer a few brief comments on um, what I see as, as perhaps a more satisfactory uh, model of measurement. Uh, overview of some of these ideas is published in this paper in epidemiology in um, 2022 and then um, two other technical reports available on archive that are, are both uh, happened to revise and resubmit. Um, but those are publicly available. So, um, you know, with measurement, um, sometimes what we're looking at is objective features of um, the, the world, a pressure age. Um, we might be concerned about measuring these things with error, but we, we at least have um, precise definitions. But when we turn to um, psychological or social constructs, things become uh, more difficult with, with things like depression or, or, or intelligence, so economic status. Um, it's often unclear what it is precisely that we're trying to assess. Um, we have to worry about definitions, about the conceptualization of it, and then the measurement of it is always indirect, typically through a series of indicators, which we think are related to um, the construct of, of interest. And so kind of the selection and categorization of these indicators um, is, is kind of a major task of measure construction. Um, and there are various practices, often just rules of, of thumb, but also statistical techniques that have been um, developed. But, but once these are, um, the indicators are selected, often it's assumed um, that there's some sort of underlying latent construct or latent variable, typically that it's, uh, or in many cases that it's unidimensional and that it gives rise to uh, the, the indicators. Um, so, so often the, you know, the speculation is that there's a univariate latent variable giving rise to the indicators, which are what we actually 
observed. So what happens, not always, but in a number of cases with, with regard to trying to validate a measure is one looks for evidence of um, unidimensionality of that latent variable based on the indicators, assume that it actually then exists. The sum or some function of the indicators is taken as an imprecise measurement of that underlying univariate latent variable. And then um, we just fit regressions or, or, or use other techniques with regard to that, that measure that we have um, constructed. Um, th there is some variation in the measure uh, theory, measurement theory literature with regard to how this is conceptualized. Um, probably the most uh, typical model is the reflective model where the latent variable gives rise to the indicators. Um, but in, in, in some cases, you know, especially with regard to things that are viewed as indices, maybe social integration, for example, um, the, what's sometimes called the formative model is um, uh, thought to, to better represent the relations between the indicators and, and the latent variable where the indicators have caused the latent variable, but uh, plus, plus some error. Um, but, but typically, again, not always, but, but often in practice, especially within psychology, um, it's assumed that that underlying um, latent variable is, is, is univariate. And so what I'd like to do in this talk is sort of challenge the notion that with these psychosocial constructs, that really anything is, is <laughs> uni, unidimensional. Um, also challenge the notion that um, evidence from factor analysis um, for a uh, unidimensional covariance structure really tells us anything about um, the underlying construct or about conceptual relations at all, and then propose an alternative interpretation of um, analyses um, using constructed measures. Um, uh, so so you know, typically what's, what's done in uh, the psychometrics literature, if we're trying to develop a, a scale, um, we have a bunch of indicators. Often these are standardized so that we've got uh, mean zero variance one, um, and uh, then fit factor analysis uh, model, which I'll give in the next slide to, to see is, you know, is this really uh, unidimensional? But, but I mean, let's suppose that it were, but let's suppose that it really was the case that there was a univariate underlying latent variable giving rise to all these indicators. Um, even if that's the case, one can distinguish between what one might call a, a statistical factor model, which, which is essentially just if, if we thought these relations were, were linear, that each of the indicators is given by linear function of the uh, latent variable plus error. Uh, typically, again, the indicators are standardized. The errors are assumed um, independently, normally independently distributed. We can relax those, those, those assumptions. But um, um, but it, it's you know typically viewed that this latent variable really does exist, and um, that it is what is causally relevant. So I'm going to say that the factor models uh, a statistical factor model, just if um, equation one holds that the indicators are given by that equation. And I'm going to distinguish that between um, between that and a what we'll call a structural factor model, because that, that basic statistical factor model is consistent with very different causal structures. It's consistent with the latent variable really being causally efficacious for the outcomes that we might be interested in. Um, but that statistical factor model is also entirely consistent with the possibility that each of the indicators has its own separate causal effect on the outcome. There's nothing in the statistical factor model that says diagram one versus diagram two is 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 correct or 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 some other one you know maybe maybe both the latent variable and the indicators have a causal effects on the on the outcome the statistical factor model tells us nothing about this um so i'll say the statistical factor model is structural um if the indicators themselves don't have causal effects on anything subsequent and if the indicators are only affected by antecedents through that latent variable uh, eta. Um, so on a causal diagram, um, uh, we would say that the, the factor eta with indicators x1 through xn is structural if there's no arrows uh, directly out of any of the x1 through xn into um, any other variable, nor any arrows um, into x1 through xn uh, except through except from um, eta it, itself. Um, that is eta is really what matters. Eta is what's causally efficacious. Um, so a causal diagram interpreted as a set of non-parametric structural equations 
um, that, that condition is really just equivalent to um, for all variables z, um, z is independent of x1 through xn conditional on eta. That, that again, it's eta that's causally efficacious. Once we know eta, the, the indicators are just that. Those are their indicators for um, the, that, that, that actual causally efficacious variable uh, eta. And this is effectively what's presupposed in um, most structural equation models with latent variables. Uh, the, the indicators give you, tell you something about that latent variable, but the arrows themselves are, are from the latent variables to other latent or observed uh, variables. Uh, any questions about um, these distinctions before I go on to the, um, the first formal result? There is a question in Q&A that just rolled in. Um, I think it's a high level question. I'll just read it to you. I wonder if the measurement problems are really any different in, say, physics. Considering measuring the concept of mass, maybe it's just a matter of degree between fields or consider Heisenberg. <laughs> That's a good, good question. I might defer on that one until the, uh, to, to sure. till the end. Um, uh, but but let's, let's definitely return to it. Um, um, OK. So, I mean, it, it turns out that um, that the assumption that um, the factor model is structural rather than just statistical, that assumption, which, which I think is often really just a presumption, it's not evaluated, it's, we, we evaluate the statistical factor model, and then if it, it fits well and suggests unidimensionality, often there's the subtle move to assuming that it is structural, but that assumption that it's structural is so strong that it has empirical implications even though we never observed the latent variable um, eta. Um, and so it's, it's really fairly straightforward to show that if um, Z is independent of X1 through Xn conditional on eta, which was you know, essentially that condition that uh, the factor model was structural. Um, and if the basic statistical factor model holds where each um, indicator is given as linear function of the latent variable, um, then one can show for any i and j and any value z of, of z that um, the expected value of indicator um, j given z equals z um, compared to the expected value of indicator i given z equals z, it's essentially need to scale with those um, uh, factor loadings lambda. Um, and, and that's because if, if e is causally efficacious, then the only way <laughs> One could get association with the indicators is um, is, is essentially through eta. Um, uh, implications of, of this, I mean, I think the, the easiest way to, to, to see this is, is thinking about, say, a randomized trial of some treatment and looking at the effects of that on um, the, the indicators themselves. If the model is structural, so if the indicators can only be affected through eta, then the effect of a randomized treatment T on indicator J um, versus the effect of T on indicator I, when those are scaled by their factor loadings, those two quantities need to be equal. Again, because um, the only way to affect XI is, is, is through, through, through eta. So these are things we can now evaluate um, em empirically. Um, but the, the result's not restricted to a randomized treatment. I mean, you could take an outcome why those who have survived after four years versus not. Um, and, and likewise, look at the, the difference in um, the indicator values for those who survive versus not scaled by the factor loading and across indicators, those quantities need, need to be equal if um, the factor models to be structural. Um, and so we can use these implications to develop statistical tests uh, to evaluate the, the hypothesis of a structural latent factor model in a wide variety of ways to, um, uh, to, to, to do this. Um, if one's willing to kind of factor model, including linearity and, and, and normality and so on, um, one can re-express those, um, those restrictions from, from the last result in, in terms of um, what would need to be the case for a uh, model for the indicators conditional on Z, if we define gamma I as expected value of the indicator I, given Z equals one, and beta W is the difference between um, the um, expected value of X1, comparing two different levels of, of, of Z, um, then one can show under the null hypothesis that the uh, factor model is structural, 
um, so that those conditions are, are imposed. Um, the expected value of xi given z uh, must be given by, by, by this form um, here. And um, then if we let uk uh, denote this quantity at the bottom of the white text here, one can construct a generalized method of moments um, uh, test under the null by, by, by minimizing uh, the test statistic here with respect to the parameters where uh, sigma here is the empirical covariance matrix of UK. Um, and one does need a further modification of this if the lambda i's are estimated, which they, you know, they typically uh, would be. Uh, but that minimum follows a chi-square distribution with d minus one times p minus one degrees of freedom, um, with, where we have um, d indicators and um, p values of, of that uh, variable z. Um, uh, one can also uh, construct alternative tests where you don't need to estimate the parameters lambda and, and are kind of less reliant on um, the distributional assumptions of the factor model, but that requires Z having more than, more than two, two levels. Um, and, and there are you know, a bunch of other tests one could in principle uh, construct here. The, the basic point is we, you know, we can test these um, empirical implications of the structural uh, latent factor model. Um, uh, and so I'll, I'll illustrate uh, this result with um, application to one of the most widely used scales in the uh, well-being literature, uh, Diner's Satisfaction with Life Scale from 1985, uh, over 33,000 citations. I actually think this is the most widely used uh, well-being well scale out there. And I, I, mean, I actually think it's, it's pretty, pretty good um, for capturing life satisfaction, not the whole of well-being, but for, for life satisfaction, I think it's, I think it's pretty good. Um, so five items, each self-rated from uh, one to seven, strongly disagree to strongly agree. In most ways, my life is close to ideal. The conditions of my life are excellent. I'm satisfied with my life. So the most important things I want in life, if I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. Um, by you know, traditional metrics, uh, this looks pretty good in terms of its psychometric properties. Convex alpha is high. Um, uh, indicators seem to load on a single factor, which explains large proportion of variance and item responses. Um, but uh, the, some of this work was, was motivated by, by an empirical analysis looking at associations between this measure and subsequent all-cause um, mortality. Um, so this data is from health and retirement study, about 13,000 individuals, mean age 66 at the um, beginning of the study. Um, and so we looked here in this analysis at tertiles of life satisfaction in 2010 and 2012 uh, with all-cause mortality four years later, controlling for a host of sociodemographic and um, uh, health-related and psychological variables, personality factors, long list here, which I won't go through in detail, but um, uh, in a um, proportional hazards model of, um, mortality over those four years of follow-up um, rest on these uh, tertiles of life satisfaction, um, controlling for these covariates, the, the association between uh, the top tertile versus the bottom tertile and all post mortality uh, was a sort of ratio of 0.74. Um, so those with high life satisfaction were 26% less likely to die over those four years of, of follow-up. Um, but we also looked at this indicator by, by indicator. Um, and for several of the indicators, the association was very similar. Um, the, the fourth one, so kind of not the most important things in life, you know, somewhat weaker, but these confidence intervals are you know, moderately wide. But for the last one, if I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. Essentially no association with, uh, with, with all cause uh, mortality. And, and, and if there really is a single univariate underlying latent variable that's causally efficacious called life satisfaction, you know, we shouldn't be observing uh, patterns like this. Um, if, if, if it is the case that that fifth indicator um, uh, it is so strongly related to that causally efficacious life satisfaction latent variable, and we shouldn't be observing patterns like this. And again, we can formally test it test that null hypothesis of a structural latent um, univariate latent variable using the statistical test just described. Doing so gives chi squared test statistic 57, importance of freedom, uh, p-value of 10 to the minus 11. Strong evidence against 
um, that, that, that null hypothesis of a univariate underlying causally efficacious latent variable, that that latent factor model is, is really structural. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think this is pretty strong evidence against <laughs> there being uh, such a, a thing. In, in terms of interpretation, it doesn't necessarily mean that the satisfaction with life scale is bad. It might be a you know, perfectly reasonable outcome summary, but it, I think it does imply that there's, there's no underlying univariate latent construct, latent variable called life satisfaction giving rise to these indicators. It's just not the right way to think about um, these indicators or about life satisfaction. Um, and, and you know, I think, again, especially in psychology, the use of these scales and then just treating them as, as a single univariate measure is, is problematic because even if we run the factor analysis, we do have evidence for a um, covariant structure that could have arisen from um, a univariate latent variable, even if there really were such a latent variable, um, it's once again consistent with very different causal structures where the, where the indicators themselves have separate causal effects. I mean, it's entirely consistent with the possibility that, that only one of the indicators was actually ca causally efficacious. There's just, there's nothing in the statistical factor model itself that allows us to distinguish between um, you know, various possibilities. So, so I, I think maybe in some cases, it's plausible that there is an underlying univariate structural latent uh, variable, but uh, uh, that needs to be established. Evidence needs to be evaluated. It, it shouldn't just be pursue, presumed. And I think without such evidence, um, it's worthwhile to look at associations indicator by indicator. Um, I mean, we, what we saw with life satisfaction is that you know, one of the indicators, uh, essentially having no regrets, had very, very different um, associations with, with subsequent uh, all cause mortality. Um, in my own view, because of examples like this, is pretty much all psychosocial constructs are, are inherently <laughs> multi dimensional. I think the notion that there's an underlying univariate latent variable is essentially a, um, a, a myth. Um, and, and this provides a result to, to, to perhaps begin to uncover more such cases. Um, and I, I, I focused this on. Um, what, are, what I referred to at the beginning as formative models, but this, you know, same issues effectively arise with, um, with indices, um, with, with, with those, um, sorry, with, with, with formative rather than reflective um, models. So I'm not gonna go into this in great detail, but this was analysis done by 2017 using nurses health study data, looking at associations between social integration and um, incident coronary heart disease. Uh, using, uh, again, a composite measure, an index uh, for social support inside the social integration index as a function of four indicators, number of close friends, community group participation, uh, religious service attendance, and marital status, uh, controlling for um, a handful of um, social demographic um, and, and health variables, looking at associations, the high versus low, a social integration group suggested uh, about a 20% reduction in incident coronary heart disease for those with high uh, social integration. Uh, but if you the, the, this this group also reported associations indicator by indicator, and there was pretty strong association with frequent religious service attendance and incident coronary heart disease, but almost nothing with the others. Maybe something with 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 marriage, though competence intervals uh, somewhat wider. Um, uh, so, so again, different patterns with, with different indicators. And we've actually done something similar with, with suicide and with, with all-cause mortality. And, and once again, um, it tends to be religious service attendance and marriage amongst these indicators that are more strongly associated with, uh, with, with these outcomes. So, so again, it, um, taking a composite measure essentially obscures uh, interpretation. We can't always do these analyses indicator by, by indicator because Sometimes sample size just isn't, isn't large enough, but when we can, I think it generally makes sense to, to do so because these are just very different facets of um, that construct of, of interest. So we might ask, why is it so common um, that, uh, um, oh, it looks like there are a few questions, so maybe I'll pause before, before moving yes. on. Uh, thanks. Uh, so there's one question by Vanessa Dizilis. I think she posted it when you were talking about structural models, when you're talking about testing. I might have missed this. Are the tests a little bit, bit like in the instrumental variable setting? We can disprove it if grossly violated, but we cannot entirely prove it. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I think I think that's I think that's right. Um, I mean, even if you found um, uh, that uh, you know, with with say all cause mortality, that there wasn't evidence against the null, you could switch to a different outcome, or or you could look at you know prior variables as 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 well. Um, but I mean, I, I think if if you <laughs> did this multiple times and uh, with with a number of different variables, the, the, the relations seem to hold. Um, it wouldn't be a proof, but but you know the evidence would be accumulating for it. But but yeah, I think that's right. You can never never prove it. One um, one other quick question, maybe. So this is from Chingguan, who is also here on the panel, so he could ask it live uh, if he wants. <clears throat> Oh, yes. Uh, so my question is, uh, why does this example that you just sh uh, shown us uh, indicate there cannot be a latent construct? So the, I guess the measurement model could be nonlinear and the measurements can uh, themselves be dependent. So if we allow increasing number of covariance terms, then this eventually you will pass that goodness of fit test. Yeah, no, um, I, I think that's a, a reasonable and, and, and fair criticism. Um, of, of this again in, in psychology at least um, the, the these models are assumed um, uh, li linear um, and um, uh, uh, you could have al al alternative relations I mean you're, you're um, and I think it would be of interest to try to generalize these approaches to allow for for nonlinear relations I mean what you can't have is one indicator just not associated at all um, with a variable, the others being associated, um, uh, because that would violate the notion that, <laughs> um, again, the latent's giving rise to, um, and, and is causally related to the the, the indicators um, themselves. But but it is it's a perfectly fair criticism um, of, of of the approach as developed um, to date. All right, so I could ask you, yeah, maybe one one more short okay. one. Uh, one is, uh, how is this related to differential item functioning? So for example, it could be that an item is not equally understood or interpreted by all people. How would that fit into the model? Um, yeah, so I mean, what, what one, um, one can um, you know, construct models where some covariate um, modifies the relation between um, the, the, the latent and um, the, the indicator. Um, and if, if that were the case, you could apply a similar test within strata of, of such covariate. So I think extensions uh, would be possible and relatively straightforward. I think the more difficult extension again is relaxing the, the linearity. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, so um, wh why is it that we assume uh, typically a, a unidimensional construct? Well, you know, I think it is uh, statistically appealing. It just makes analyses easier. It's become standard practice. It corresponds to these traditional reflective informative models. Uh, but I think also we just don't bother <laughs> thinking about or um, evaluate evidence for um, whether whether that factor is is, is structural. But it, again, it's just, it's just, it's an assumption. Um, even if you don't buy the linearity <laughs> um, assumption here in the tests that are developed, it's still an assumption that's being made and and that ought to be uh, evaluated. I think, and actually in most contexts, it's an implausible. Uh, assumptions. I think the burden of proof really should be on those who claim uh, that there is an underlying univariate uh, lat latent variable. Um, and to try to make this case further, I'm going to present one more uh, technical result with, which pertains to what happens if the supposed factors, I've, I've kind of ceased believing in <laughs> um, these, these univariate latent factors, but what happens if the supposed factors causally affect one another? Um, and this can arise, say, with, with depression and anxiety. Maybe we have a separate factor for each, but um, you know, evidence suggests that if you become depressed, you're more likely to become anxious. Not everyone does, but more, more likely to become anxious. And likewise, if you're anxious, you're more likely to become uh, depressed. And I think those causal relations can um, obscure uh, the interpretation of uh, a factor uh, analysis. So I'm going to suppose now that we have not just one, but um, potentially 
um, m different latent variables. So the easiest case will be just two uh, um, latent variables giving rise to, again, a series of, of indicators um, uh, so that uh, that vector y is given by some uh, function of the latent variables plus uh, an error term. And, and I'll, I'll consider kind of an ideal case even where um, the the indicators load separately on, on say two different factors. So the result will be um, applicable more, more, more generally. But even in this ideal case where let's say all of the depression indicators loaded only on depression and all of the anxiety indicators loaded only on anxiety, even if that were the case, um, we're gonna see that things become obscured over time if there are causal relations. If it's the case um, that one of the factors causally affects the other or, or, or possibly both over, over time, um, but that at any given time point, the indicators, again, are just given as linear functions of uh, the latent variables at that time period, and there's no cross-loadings cross, cross loadings here. So if it's the case that eta at time t is given as a function of eta at time t minus one, uh, plus, again, random error term, uh, then we have the result uh, that, that, that follows. Um, so we have our uh, latent factor model at a given um, time where the indicators are given as linear function of the latent variables. Uh, the latent variable at time t is a linear function of the latent variables at time t minus one, where again, there could be uh, cross factor causal effects here plus um, a random error term. Um, and I'm gonna assume that the WT here for this result are independently and normally distributed, though potentially with distinct parameters at each, at each time point. Um, if we let B be the Jordan decomposition of, of B, that matrix corresponding to the causal effects, where D is um, an M by M matrix of Jordan normal form, um, then uh, one can show that if that process YT is to converge into distribution, um, to some random variable y star. Um, uh, and if uh, v is invertible, uh, and I think these conditions are stronger than, than necessary, but one can get result under these. And if those random variables yt decay sufficiently quickly such that this quantity converges in distribution to some normally distributed variable w star, uh, then uh, y will also, y star, the, the limit as t tends to infinity, will also follow a linear. Uh, factor model where the rank of um, eta star, um, the, uh, the latent, the, the, the um, latent variable that this process converges to, the rank of that will be given by the rank of D star, where D star is limit of the um, Jordan normal form matrix D uh, to, to T. Um, but one can then show that if um, the original latent variable vector eta has dimension two, then the only way that it can converge to a uh, latent factor model with, which also has dimension two, the only way we can uh, um, retain the two factors rather than have it collapse to one is if that matrix B expressing the causal effects is the identity matrix. In other words, if um, there are no cross factor causal effects, if one factor causes um, has a causal effect on the other factor, then under these conditions, um, the process um, governing the, the indicators will converge to um, uh, a latent factor model with just dimension one. The two factors will essentially collapse into one um, over, over time. Um, and, in, and in the actual paper, I also carry out some simulations and under um, you know, fairly reasonable parameters, often within three, four, five, six steps, um, statistical tests, even with sample sizes, 1,000, 3,000, um, really can't distinguish between the, the, the two factors um, any, any longer. So the, it converges pretty, pretty quickly to a, um, a model with just one, one factor. And, and so, and I think this also challenges the conclusions that we might draw from um, a factor analysis with, with one wave of, 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 of data, because even if we have evidence for unidimensionality with factor analysis of one wave of data, um, sure, maybe there's only one underlying univariate latent variable, but maybe there are two which causally affect one another, and over time it just looks like um, there's there's one. And, and so, you know, I, I think um, 
the notion, like once again, that um, a factor analysis um, that suggests that the covariant structure can be explained by a single univariate latent variable really doesn't tell us much uh, with regard to what the underlying causal structures um, in fact are. And, and you know, this arises in, in practice in a number of, of, of settings, uh, it, specifically with anxiety and depression. It, your paper, um, psychologists believe that anxiety and depression self-report scales have distinct constructs. This assumption was tested using confirmatory factor analysis on mood data from non-clinical samples. Um, this analysis provide evidence that anxiety and depression self-report scales do not measure uh, discriminant mood constructs and may therefore be better thought of as measures of general negative mood rather than as measures of anxiety and depression per, per se. Um, another paper uh, about 20 years later looking at 28 different data sets doing a meta factor uh, analysis with um, anxi hospital anxiety and depression scales. And you know, their conclusion again is due to the presence of a general factor the hospital anxiety and depression scale does not provide good separation between symptoms of anxiety and depression. We recommend it is best used as a measure of general distress. I mean, essentially what they're saying is anxiety and depression are the, are the same thing. These scales should just be some, we shouldn't distinguish between them. And on conceptual grounds, I think this is essentially nonsense. The, the, the emotions underlying anxiety and depression, sadness and fear are, 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 are distinct. I think what's going on here is just anxiety has causal effects on depression, depression on anxiety. And so over time, it, it, it's going to look like there's just one factor. But, but again, evidence from lots of longitudinal studies for, for causal effects in um, both directions. And so the results of these factor analysis is exactly what we would anticipate, even if there were two distinct factors, but causally affected one another um, over, over time. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think this possibility that the factors calls, causally affect one another um, uh, makes it difficult to interpret these, these factor analyses to sort of distinguish between um, causal versus conceptual relations. And in um, you know, a lot of the social science disciplines and economics and, and statistics and epidemiology, you know, we, we know that association does not imply causation. And, and we're very careful to distinguish between them and we try to articulate the assumptions needed to move from association to causation, but but you know the, the, the fallacy that correlation implies causation, we might call the, the causal fallacy. And we're very careful to um, try to protect ourselves um, from that. But I think almost the opposite fallacy occurs in the psychometric measurement literature, um, where it, it's effectively assumed that correlation never implies causation. It always indicates a conceptual uh, relationship. Um, and, and this too is wrong. Um, of course, associations can arise because of conceptual relations, but they can also arise because of because of causal uh, re relations. And so I think this has not this point has not been taken seriously or into account in um, the measure development work. So we might refer to this as the you know as the measurement uh, fallacy. And I think it's perhaps at least as problematic as the as the causal fallacy. But it's it's in the opposite direction. Um, I think often we uh, accept the notion that to do good causal inference, we need good measurement. Um, but I think the converse is also the case. To do good measure development work, we need, we need good causal inference. We need to think about these causal uh, re relationships. Um, so again, I think evidence from a one-way factor analysis of uh, that, that the um, correlation structure is fit well by a univariate latent variable really doesn't tell us anything about the nature of the underlying construct, whether it's unidimensional or, or not, because of the possibility of causal relationships. And moreover, from the you know, prior results, even if there is truly a univari underlying univariate variable, it may be that um, each of the indicators, in fact, still has distinct causal effects on the outcomes that we care about. Now, my own view is almost all these psychosocial constructs are, are uh, multivariate, and we just don't think about this and see this because of the practices, these practices has, have developed as they have. Um, so how might we uh, proceed? Um, I'll, I'll just give one uh, res further uh, result on, on kind of interpretation of analyses um, that uh, that employ a constructed measure from a series of indicators, but, but don't rely on the notion that there is a underlying univariate latent variable. Um, so I, I am going to assume that <laughs> um, that there 
um, we've got a series of indicators x1 through xn, um, and um, and we construct some measure a based on those. That could be a you know sum of those uh, measures or, or or some other function of them. Um, I'll let y be the outcome of interest and y k the potential outcome if uh, I'm going to assume that there's some underlying latent process going on, but potentially highly, highly multivariate. I'm not going to make any assumptions about the nature of this. Um, so there's some underlying process. E eta highly multivariate, to note that here is k. Um, and so y k will be the potential outcome y would observe if k had been set to, to k. Um, but that once we know k, if a conditional on co covariance L and k, um, A tells us A is independent of, of the outcome itself. Moreover, I'm going to assume, and I'll come back to this assumption because it's somewhat problematic um, in, in terms of trying to evaluate it, but assume that um, conditional on our covariance, measured covariance L, um, that, that, that um, multivariate latent K is independent of the potential outcome so that we have conditional on L the effect of K and Y is, is, is unconfounded. Um, uh, and that when consistency assumption holds in K is KY, K equals uh, Y. Um, and what one can, can show, this is kind of a generalization of prior work on multiple versions of, of, of treatment theory, but what one can show is if, if one used a naive estimator using our measure A, comparing the outcomes for two levels of A uh, standardized by um, the covariates L. Um, so this would be kind of our naive estimator causal effect using just our measure A. If, if it's the case that the covariates L do in fact control for confounding for the effect of K on Y, um, then we can interpret our naive estimator as um, a comparison uh, between essentially two randomized treatment regimes. Um, one of which is we look at the distribution of K amongst those with A equals little a, and we essentially randomize within levels of L, we randomize uh, each individual to a, a, a version of treatment K um, uh, chosen from the distribution of K amongst those with A is little a versus A is A star. Um, so if, if um, you know, we think levels treatment of 10 and 20, we'd look at, um, you know, maybe this is life satisfaction score, but we'd look at the whole series of Sort of life trajectories that would get one to a life satisfaction sort of 20 um, and randomize um, an individual to, to, to one of those trajectories versus um, the distribution of life trajectories that would get them to a life satisfaction score of 10. And then we look at the outcomes, all cause mortality, say that we, so that we care about. Um, so it does provide. No, no, sorry to interrupt you, just to remind you of the time, you have around five minutes left. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up, try to wrap up soon. Um, uh, um, so it does give it an interpretation of these analyses when we construct measures, but it, it's um, there, there are real challenges in interpretation. You know, if, if, if we don't know what this underlying versions of treatment variable eta or k is, um, then the interpretation is going to be somewhat ambiguous. We have no way of implementing this in practice with regard to, to interventions. It's difficult to assess the confounding assumptions. Again, if we don't know what that underlying uh, multivariate like variable eta is, um, and, uh, uh, and, and then the, um, the interpretation of the distributions of eta um, does vary depending on what we, what we control for in, in L. Um, but I think this might be the best we can do with either ill-defined treatments or with, with these um, constructed measures. It provides a, you know, admittedly somewhat ambiguous, but, but at least a, a formal interpretation of, of these results. And I do think awareness of these limitations, of these problems in interpretation actually helps us uh, be aware of, of, of what we're, we're doing and the ambiguity inherent in these analyses using psychosocial constructs. Um, uh, I think I might skip over this, but we, I mean, we, can, we can come back to this. This, the, this interpretation applies even if um, eta were uh, a single univariate latent variable, but it is um, applicable um, more, more, more generally. But I think when um, it, it's also applicable, even if we kind of take a look at the indicators one, uh, one, one by one, and I, I think in general, it is worthwhile doing so. Um, uh, so a couple of final remarks on what I see as a more satisfactory model for, for, for measurement. I think we have some 
very complex underlying reality giving rise to um, the, the phenomena related to the construct of interest that goes on to shape the outcomes that we might care about, um, that, that highly multivariate uh, latent process is giving rise to our indicators by which we, we form um, measures. And I think you know, the, the reflective models get right that um, and our indicators are always a function of um, a more comp an underlying latent reality, but I just think they make the mistake of often confusing that with something that is in fact univariate. But simultaneously, that underlying reality is giving rise to our language, our concepts from which we define more precisely defined constructs. Um, and um, I think there needs to be a better mapping between our, our concepts <laughs> and, and constructs and the indicators. We need more precisely defined um, uh, in, in, uh, construct definitions, and then we need mappings from that to the items that we're using and, and an understanding of whether the, the items are, are necessary, sufficient, necessary and sufficient, or just illustrative of the construct um, of, of interest. But I think really this is sort of the work of, of analytic uh, philosophy that needs to be brought into this measure construction process. The, the, the multiple versions of treatment result kind of gives one a radical freedom uh, to, to use any uh, constructed measure one wants, but then it puts the onus of interpretation um, on the, the, the items that are being used and, and their relations to the constructs uh, that, that we care about. I think likewise, we need an understanding of the processes giving rise to item responses um, uh, and, and that's more a question of, of psychology, um, of, of understanding how people are responding in surveys um, to, uh, to, 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 these, to these items. So I think, um, I think a lot of these questions, which really are conceptual or, or analytic, we've tried to pretend are, are, are empirical. And I just, I think the empirical analyses don't tell us much um, about the, the actual conceptual relations. And so in conclusion, again, I think this assumption that there's an underlying univariate latent variable that's structural is extremely strong. Um, it's one that can um, be tested to, to a certain extent, it, it, it at least, but, um, but in practice, it's often just presumed. And, I, and again, I think the burden of proof really should come, be placed on those who claim there's the univariate uh, latent construct. I, I do think causal relationships between supposedly underlying factors make um, the process of trying to discover these supposedly structural factors even more um, challenging. Um, but I don't think you know, the, the, the notion of just taking a sum of indicators or constructing measures is necessarily problematic. This uh, work on interpretation via multiple versions of treatment theory does provide um, a potential formal causal interpretation um, even though it's ambiguous to the extent we don't really understand those underlying um, processes. Again, I think when data allow, looking at indicator by indicator analyses can be preferable, can give us new um, insights, and, and I think we do need a better mapping between um, our constructs of interests and the, the items and measures um, that we use. So I'll conclude here. Thank you all for, for, for listening and happy to hand, thing, hand things over to my discussant. I don't seem to be able to share while you're sharing, Tyler. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Oops. Um, okay, perfect. Thank you very much. And thank you also for the nice talk. So reading this these paper, what made me, the thing that, that made me think of is this uh, alleged story that medieval scholars spend a lot of time thinking about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. And I think one way to interpret what Tyler is saying here is that that's basically what we're doing here and that maybe in in uh, 500 years, people will look back and say, like, how many latent factors are there in the model is basically being a similar type of, of, of question. Um, so um, there are... Uh, three main points here in three papers. So the first paper is, is saying that structural univariate linear latent factor models have testable implication, those of them fail. The second paper, which I think is technically the most interesting paper is saying that the, there are n structural uh, latent factor, if there are n structural latent factors that cause factors that are, we might not be able to, to find those latent factors in a single time period. And, and the, the two structural latent factors uh, case, I think was the most illustrative of that. 
And the final paper uh, extends the multiple versions of treatment interpretation and show that we can use that to understand uh, latent factor models, even when that model in some sense is, is wrong. And I, I think the grand conclusions that I draw from this is that um, we shouldn't take latent factor models literally, but perhaps we should take them, take them seriously. Okay, so uh, I think the, uh, I, I will not go more into summarizing, go more into detail into the actual results. But I think that this example, which which is kind of a play on, on title example during the during the talk, is is quite illustrative. So this is the life satisfactions indicators, and I pulled out two of them. So the conditions in my life are excellent, and if I could live my life over, I would change almost everything. And if we consider three scenarios, so the first, first scenario, I gambled all my savings in Las Vegas and I lost. So I would say that. That's, both of these does not hold there, that neither of these hold, right? So my conditions are not excellent and I would probably change something if I could live it over. But if I'm diagnosed with a terminal disease that caused by genetics, then my, the conditions of my life are probably not excellent, but it might not be the case that I want to change anything if I could live it over, right? There's nothing I could do, presumably, to prevent this disease. And I would be very happy with all the choices that I've made. And similarly, if I gamble all my savings in Las Vegas and I happen to win a lot of money, then my conditions in my life might be excellent, but I might regret doing that because I realized that I was a, a bad thing to do. And I think that this life satisfaction uh, example is a very good way of showing that that like we know already that life satisfaction is multidimensional. It's kind of nonsensical to me to, to think of life satisfaction, um, at least in a, in a broader sense, as being unidimensional. And I, I think that these examples are a good way of showing that. The, the most important message of, the, of this, this paper, which I go, think goes beyond only thinking about uh, latent factors, is, is the importance of conceptual questions. So everyone I think should read, everyone in quantitative social science should read the, the third paper here. And I pulled this quote, which I think summarizes the, the kind of main mes message in a good way. So Tyler writes, the conflation of construct and variable and the presumption of the universe underlying reality has led to the notion that nature of the concept is to be discovered empirically from analysis of correlations. Items are proposed, factor analysis implemented, it is assumed that we somehow thereby come to understand the meaning of the construct itself. And the emphasis here is, is my own. And I think that this is this is um, a very naive view, right? Like the 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 the, the, the definition of the of the concept that we're interested in comes somehow after the measurements of them or the measurements of the indicators. And intuitively that, can't, that, that make, doesn't make any sense uh, at all. And I think that the, the third paper very much does that point, point well. And uh, the, the example with the researcher who was suggesting that exciting depression is the same thing, is a, it's a very striking example, but some version of this pops up in less noticeable way all over the place and not only in factor analysis. And it shows, the, the example of the factor analysis shows what goes wrong if we shy away from, from conceptual questions. So that is my, my biggest takeaway from this paper is that we should, we, we have to engage with the conceptual questions. Okay, so some, some questions and, and comments. Uh, it is very clear that you are skeptical about current practice, but it's somewhat unclear to me in what way you're, you're skeptical. And I think there's four levels here that one can interpret what you're saying. Uh, going from uh, benign to less benign. So the most benign interpretation is saying like the current practice is somewhat, sometimes, often, or always providing um, misleading conclusions. And slightly more less benign is that latent constructs are generally not univariate. And this is kind of what's stated in the papers. This seems to be what the tape papers are about, but reading between the lines and also what you mentioned during the talk and, and in the interpretation of the multivariate treatments, seem to say something more, that either that latent variables can never be identified, so we shouldn't strive to find them. Like the whole endeavor is kind of uh, futile in some sense, or even that latent variables don't exist as a meaningful concept. It's not only that we can't find them, they don't exist. And and so I, I, I'm interested to see if, if that is kind of what you really are saying here, or if, if I've kind of overinterpreted you. And the reason why I think this is this that uh, why I read it in this way is because I think that uh, the definition of structural factors is somewhat murky. So I, I really like the difference between the statistical and the structural factors, but it's unclear to me what a structural factor is. And you define it based on a DAG and, and, and saying if there's errors from the indicators and so on. But the problem with this is that it is dependent on the DAG representation itself, and it's also dependent on the indicators of those factors. And the problem with that is that Defining the structural factors purely in the DAG conflates the representation of them with the, with the essence of it. In some sense, it's kind of doing what you're criticizing people using latent factors to do. 
because the, the DAGs are a representation of it, but it can hardly define it. And we could try to use the usual conceptual grounding of DAGs, just saying that they are representing interventions in, in the DAG, but we can't really do that when it comes to latent factors, because first of all, we never observe them and we can never intervene on them directly. And they're usually some type of abstract concept that is kind of inherently impossible to intervene on. And including the indicators in the definitions of the structural factors makes the definition circular, right? We cannot separate, if the definition of what a structural factor is depends on the indicators, we cannot ask, should we use these indicators to capture this structural factor? Because the, the structural factor depends on the, the definition of that thing depends on the indicators. So it becomes circular and, and therefore, therefore the, the, mean, the concept seems to become meaningless. And intuitively it seems that real structural factors should exist independent of indicators. The factors comes before the indicators in some, some sense. And I think related to this, it's, it's a somewhat unclear what is meant by a latent factors being cautiously efficacious. What, what does that, it's unclear to me what that, what that really means. And I think the, the, the multiple versions of treatment interpretation provides an alternative definition. And that is saying that latent factors are really just labels. Like structural factors either cannot be discovered or they don't exist. And what the multiple versions of treatment is saying is that a particular value of a constructed measure is simply a shorthand. It's nothing more than a shorthand for a collection of underlying observed, usually multidimensional aspects of factors. And that is somehow rejecting the whole point of, of the, like the saying that structural factors do not exist. This might be a convenient way to summarize stuff, but they don't exist as an independent concept itself. And one consequence of this, as, as you mentioned in the talk, is that constructive measures cannot be wrong. There's no sense that they can be wrong. And I, I think this is very appealing to me. It's clear and avoids of those conceptual issues, but it's some, in some way kicking the can down the road, right? Like policymakers and so on will read more into these measures than what's motivated by the multiple versions of treatment. And I think that they have to in order to use these measures. Like if you only restrict yourself to multiple versions of treatment, we can't really use these, these, these factors because it doesn't tell it, it doesn't answer the question, what does this measure tell me? It tells me what, what it is, but it doesn't tell me what it says about the world. And uh, so, so one interpretation, I, and I'm interested in see if, again, if, it's, if you would agree on that is, is to say that, uh, that this is really a call of, that we should leave scientific realism and then instead use something along the lines of instrumentalism. So intuitively, there are good and bad measures. Like this kind of complete nihilism when it comes to measurements, anything goes. It's, I mean, it's definitely not productive, but, but it doesn't seem right either. And my interpretation of, of, of the multiple versions treatment is said that it's some type of instrumentalism. The purpose is not to find truth, so to speak, but it, the purpose is to find concepts that are useful. And that is orthogonal to whether they are true or not. Like something can be useful even though it's not true, and something can be true without being useful. And this gives a way, this gives researchers a way to defend their measurements. Like it, it escapes denialism, but without the need to resort to kind of real latent factors. But I, I think it's important to note here is that I think it's, it's attractive, but it, it, it's important to note that this is very different from the way that researchers conceptualize what they're doing, right? They, they seem to be trying to find truth not to find something that is useful. And that is especially true in, in a lot of social sciences. And a, a, a bit of a tangent, but I think it's an interesting tangent is that many natural sciences works in this way. So, so I haven't taken physics since high school, but from what I understand, physicists used several representation of classical mechanics. So there's Newtonian mechanics and the underlying concepts here are the Newton laws of, of motion. So the latent variables are forces, but then there's also the Lagrangian uh, mechanics and the underlying concept is different is the principle of least actions and the latent variable are energies. So these are different representations. And the intuitive interpretation of the Newtonian and the Lagrangian mechanics are different. Like, so if we were to kind of ask, query these, these representations and, and, and ask them for explanation why the world works in the way it does, it would give different explanations. But all observable consequences of these representations are identical. And from what I understand, most physicists would say that they are metaphys metaphysically equivalent. They are the same. There's no difference really, but, uh, between them, except that some of uh, Newtonian mechanics is useful in some context and the Grandian mechanics is useful in other concepts. And maybe that is the way we should see latent factors, that they are can be useful, but it's not really meaningful to talk about whether they are true. Um, so in the interest of time, I have some smaller points. These popped up during the, 
during the talk uh, to, to summarize them quickly. But so I think that these problems pops up also with stuff that we actually do measure. So for example, the, condi the conditions of my life are excellent on a seven point scale. That is a clear direct measurement, but it's unclear what it is a measurement of. What does a four on that scale mean? I, I have no idea. We can, like we measure it, but it doesn't, this doesn't really answer the question. So I, I wonder if we always have some version of this problem. And finally, the test. So it, like, so this is both testing, this came up on the talk as well. So they're both testing a univariate structural factor plus some stipulated relationship. And often it seems that that stipulated relationship is kind of more problematic than a univariate structure. But a, a bigger question is, if we do the multiple version of treatment interpretation, what's the point of testing this? Like, what are we really testing if, if we take that interpretation, because there's really no way in, in that is right and wrong, right? Um, so those were the things that I had. Thank you very, very much for, for the talk. All right, thanks very much for the nice discussion. Yeah, Tyler, you will have now quickly the opportunity to respond and after that we can take some more questions. Great, well, thank you, Frederick, for a, a wonderful and enlightening <laughs> discussion. I feel there's enough here to, to, to keep me thinking for many months uh, to, to come. Um, uh, I'll, I'll maybe make three uh, re remarks on some of the points you, you raised. Um, you know, one, if we go back to slide six, you, you kind of had different levels of, of interpretation. Um, and um, uh, um, and I, I'd probably position myself at, at present somewhere between two, two and three. Um, uh, you know, my view is that constructs are almost always um, multi-dimensional um, and the, the notion that there typically is an underlying univariate latent variable is just plain plain wrong. Um, can they be identified even when they're multi-dimensional? I mean, I, I, possibly. Um, and, and I mean, I think this comes to the point on, on truth and usefulness uh, as, as well. I mean, maybe there are clusters of indicators that do always, you know, what they call in psychology, hang together so that the associations with other variables are always pretty consistent. Maybe these are just, you know, different ways of asking the, the, the same thing. Um, I think if that's so, we have a lot more work to, to do <laughs> um, to, to, to uncover those. So I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't necessarily position myself at point uh, three, may, maybe I will, maybe I'll get there, but I, I before committing to that, um, you know, I'd want to see more, to, to my mind, sensible exploration of can we identify something that does, at least as a reasonable approximation, seem what, what, what I was calling structural. Um, you know, the, the critique of, of how I was even defining <laughs> structural, I think, is, you know, likewise, uh, reasonable. I, I, I do think if, if I was trying to make a um, constructive case um, that there is circularity built into to, to what I was saying, but an alternative framing of this is um, saying, look, I, I'm not the one proposing that we do these factor analyses and then conclude that there's a unidimensional um, latent variable. I'm taking what's being done in practice, within the frameworks that are being employed, and and saying, uh, look, this subtle move from a statistical um, factor model to a structural factor model is a big leap, and and one that's done, you know, without any uh, evaluation. So, you know, I would position this more as a critique of current practices than, you know, a, a, a pro my proposed definition of a. Uh, structural factor. But I mean, I, I think you know, both of those kind of at what level of interpretation operating and, and this question of um, what is a structural factor is, is an interesting one and, and um, one I will ponder further. But again, I think one can position the paper just as a critique of existing practices without my committing to a definition of a um, structural factor. But it, it, again, it is something I'll ponder further. Um, and then that brings me to the third point I'd like to just briefly comment on, which is Sort of truth versus versus use usefulness. Um, you know, I, I do think um, a, a lot of um, uh, the work examining psychosocial constructs um, can be framed as 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 what's useful. What aspects of psychology should we you know should we fo focus um, on? 
Uh, I think it's interesting just looking at different aspects of well-being and seeing which ones are more strongly correlated with, uh, with all-cause mortality. Feeling happy is much weaker than life satisfaction, which is weaker than having a sense of purpose in life. And these, these are, it's telling us something. It's giving us clues, I would say, as to what, what is um, most relevant. And, um, and, and, and so, you know, I, I do think of framing as to what sorts of analyses might inform um, action and, 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 and policies or guide us to what we should be focusing on. I, you know, I, think, I think that's worthwhile. Um, I think also, and, you know, another way to, to frame the, the usefulness question is with current practices um, where, where we just, you know, factor analysis conclude there's univariate late variable and it's a single scale and we can just sum it. What, what are we obscuring? When are we missing things? Um, and and, and you know, I, that's part of what I want to push with the, um, this, this work is a, the deeper consideration of, of what, what we might be missing. Um, and you know, I, I do think when data allow looking at the indicators um, separately um, can, can give additional clues. Um, you know, with, with regard to truth, I, I, um, I, I view science as having the goal both of you know, contributing to um, questions of, 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 of sensible action to, to achieve our goals, but, but also um, pointing us um, towards truth. And, um, uh, and you know, I, but my view of truth would be that we can make statements which are in correspondence uh, with, with reality. And while I don't think um, these sorts of analyses allow us to make um, precise statements about <laughs> structural factors that are in any way true, I, I, I do think um, over time, um, they provide sufficient evidence to make uh, reasonable truth claims. Um, something along the lines of um, positive psychological states affect bodily health, I think we have very strong evidence for. Um, so that's not a precise statement about quantitative effect sizes and, 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 and factors, but um, uh, I, I think our evidence for that is much stronger um, now than it was 50 um, years ago, our empirical evidence at least. Um, and, and I think these sorts of analyses do um, contribute to, to making those, those, those truth claims. So I, you know, I think a lot more work probably needs to be done on um, what exactly do they contribute? How are we interpreting these? And then how do we move from uh, what, what with psychosocial constructs are always, you know, some degree of, of, of ambiguity um, to truth claims we're willing to defend need, needs a greater spelling out. But I, I, and I wouldn't say that um, empirical investigation of psychosocial constructs is restricted in science to, to usefulness. I do think it has a role also in pointing us towards truth. So there's a lot more in, in that <laughs> discussion that was worth comment on, but I'll restrict my remarks to those responses and I'll ponder the rest further in the weeks and months ahead. So thank you again, Frederick. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Tyler and uh, Frederick for the wonderful talk and discussion for the interest of time. We have to conclude the seminar today. <clears throat> so just next week, we have a, a PhD uh, a couple of PhD talks, uh, both uh, Tim Morrison and Harrison Lee are from Stanford and uh, they'll give us a deep dive into the tiebreaker design. So I hope I'll see you all next week. <laughs>